My dear friends, today is the 10th Sunday after Pentecost. It's also the feast of St. Eusebius, who is commemorated with the second collect of the Mass. The third collect is the Acunctis, beseeching the Blessed Virgin and the saints for their intercession. I'd like to thank in particular three men who've been working on the fence around the playground and the parking lot, Mr. Mike Mueller, Mr. Timothy Conkle, Mr. Robert Nagley. Thank you very much for the hard work you put in the last few days. Please, I ask your prayers especially for Mrs. Margaret Nagley, Mrs. Patricia Bendel, and Mr. Jason Schultz. Mrs. Nagley was anointed yesterday. Mrs. Bendel's in the nursing home up in uh, Washington Courthouse. And Jason Schultz is quite sick, if you remember him in your prayers. I remind you, tomorrow is a holy day, the Assumption of the Blessed Virgin Mary. There's an 8 o'clock low mass, which will start at least by 8. I have a 10, 15 flight. And then there's a 6 p.m. mass, which Father Jenkins will say tomorrow evening. On Tuesday, please call before you come to mass on Monday evening. Call for Tuesday. It's my intention in the bulletin, but I will be flying from Cleveland at 8 in the morning. Uh, so I don't know if there'll be an 8 o'clock mass or not as scheduled in the bulletin. Please call Monday night about the 8 o'clock low mass on Tuesday. And no man can say the Lord Jesus, but by the grace of the Holy Ghost, in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen. My dear friends, if we're in the habit of misusing the tongue with profanity, or even worse, with blasphemy, do we think that we're going to be given a special grace on our deathbed to pronounce the holy name of our Lord Jesus Christ? If one were to pronounce the holy name in reverence the hour of their death, they would receive a plenary indulgence and be taken straight to heaven if they have a hatred of venial sin. In the epistle, St. Paul reminds the Corinthians of the many blessings they have received from Almighty God. Corinth, as I've mentioned to you before, was one of the most corrupt cities in the world. It rivaled Sodom and Gomorrah. Corinth uh, was very wicked, just as Berlin was before World War II. Berlin was the porno, porno capital of the world at that time. And we can see how that corrupted the minds of the individuals such that they would follow the likes of Hitler. As pagans, the Corinthians, when they first heard of the works of our Lord Jesus Christ, when they first heard his holy name, they cursed it. But by the grace of God and the efforts of St. Paul for several years, they were now convinced of the truth of St. Paul's word, they were convinced of the truth of the testimony of our Lord Jesus Christ. St. Paul goes on to name some of these gifts meant to convince the early Christians of Christ's truth. These miracles, St. Paul mentions, would become more rare as the clarity of doctrine and truths become easier to understand and to accept. In the Gospel, we see the story of the Pharisee and the publican, quite familiar. St. Luke relates this parable told by our Lord in order to teach us never to proudly condemn or despise another. Even if that person appears impious, even if that person appears wretched. Did not St. Martin notice a man poorly clothed, despised by others as a poor beggar? Was it not our Lord himself? The repentant spirit of the publican justified him, whereas the proud spirit of the Pharisee did not justify him and even did worse. The publican was doing as St. John the Baptist had asked. 
do penance for one's sins, acknowledge one's sins, and then do penance for them. Perhaps some of us entered into the temple today, our church, Immaculate Conception, with the spirit of the Pharisee rather than the spirit of the publican, the repentant publican, reflecting upon our own sinfulness will influence our prayers, our decisions, and our life. Abraham reflected upon his nothingness to inspire humility in himself, a true understanding of his self-worth. He reflected upon the fact that he, you and I, are dust of the earth. King David became great by his prayers filled with humility, gratitude, and praise to Almighty God. St. James tells us that God listens to the prayers of the humble. And he also says that God resists the prayers of the proud. We saw that in the first children, Cain and Abel, how God was pleased with the prayers of Abel, how God resisted the prayers of Cain, because they were no prayers. The Pharisee's prayer was unacceptable to God because the Pharisee did not lift up his heart to God. He gave our Lord a litany of his own supposed virtues, which in fact merited him very little or even damaged his own soul in pride. The publican's prayer, which is imitated at the altar, was acceptable to God. For though it was short, it was humble, and it was contrite. Looking down, the publican acknowledged himself unworthy of God. The servers and the priest is instructed, they are instructed, to not lift their eyes during the prayers at the foot of the altar. Their head is to be bowed in imitation of this publican. The publican confessed his sins. The priests and the servers, the servers for you, pray the confitier and confess your sins before our Lord. It's not until the announcement of the redemption of mankind, the Gloria, that the priest lifts his head and lifts his eyes to the crucifix. He strikes his own heart in punishment, as did the publican there in prayer. At the confit here, we strike our breasts to acknowledge our faults and our sins. The gospel tells us that he who exalts himself shall be humbled. The Pharisee returned from the temple as you will return in an hour's time. What will you carry in your hands? Will you carry the treasures of God's friendship? Or will your hands be like carrying water in the desert where it all falls out and then the rest evaporates? The humble sinner is better in the sight of God than is the proud just man. More blessed is he that has sorrow for his sins then as scripture says, 99 who have no need, the 99 proud. He who glories in his own supposed good works or performs them to please men loses any sort of supernatural merit whatsoever. We find that in Matthew, the sixth chapter. A continual remembrance of this parable will help us to despise vainglory. It is the antidote to the poison of vainglory. If we do not labor for God, all that we try to accumulate in this life will soon be lost in shipwreck. Your morning offerings, my dear friends and faithful, are so very important. They will help you to consecrate your good works to God. 
and they will make many actions throughout the day meritorious. Strive at the beginning of every day, and if you can, every good work, to consecrate it to Almighty God. Pride is like a chameleon. You can't necessarily see the chameleon once it has changed its colors to suit its environment. Pride is often hidden. Pride remains undetected. Pride hides itself but can be manifest by the desire to surpass all in earthly honors and praise. The proud man is a poor judge of himself, his own self-worth. The humble man and woman despises no one but himself, as did the publican despise his faults and his sins. This makes us pleasing to Almighty God. We remember that he who exalts himself shall be humbled. He who humbles himself shall be exalted. Nobody likes a bragger. Nobody likes bragging. Nor does our Lord. The gifts of miracles St. Paul mentioned in the epistle are not necessary for our salvation. But grace is. Humility is necessary for salvation. Grace is that gift of God earned through the merits of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ to enable us to do good. That should be first and foremost in your mind to do good and thus save our souls. There's two ways of obtaining grace. By meriting it, by good acts and by the beneficence of Almighty God who generously showers graces upon the humble. God love you and God bless you. In the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost. Amen.